in Ishnua, Philly's home for contemporary Irish plays, is opening their 21st season with a bold adaptation of The Playboy of the Western World by Nigerian playwright B.C. Adugan and Irish writing icon Roddy Doyle. This spinoff of a classic Irish story is set in modern Dublin as a Nigerian refugee arrives at a rundown pub with a wild tale he hopes will save his life. Major support for the Playboy of the Western World has been provided by the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, with additional support from the Government of Irish Immigrant Support Program. Get tickets online at inishnuatheater.org. Thrive Flower is Philadelphia's first same-day cannabis delivery. They offer a wide range of products, so you can find something or multiple things that works best for your unique needs. Thrive Flower is selling third-party, lab-tested, real THC products, including flour, pre-rolls, vapes, and gummies. Head to thriveflower.com and use the code CityCastPhilly10 for 10% off your orders. Today on CityCast Philly, I'm in West Philly at the Woodlands, one of the oldest gardens in the country, surrounded by cicadas, trees, building renovations, and headstones. I'm talking with a local author and garden enthusiast about what makes Philly a vibrant horticulture hotspot, plus the public gardens you need to check out. It's Thursday, September 19th. I'm Trina Nuri, and here's what Philly's talking about. Nicole Jude, author of Private Gardens of Philadelphia. Thank you for joining me today at the Woodlands. Hi, Trené. It's nice to be here with you. This is my first time. How many times have you been here? I mean, maybe a hundred times. This place uh, predates me by some time, I would say. It goes back to the 18th century, and it was one of the most beautiful estates in the colonial era anywhere in America. One of the most sophisticated too, and very English. William Hamilton was the original owner of this place and he was a tree collector and a plant collector. Was it always a cemetery? No, it became a cemetery in the 19th century. It is a really interesting artifact of an 18th century garden when Hamilton's descendants couldn't really keep it up anymore. And it's 54 acres now, I believe, but originally it was much bigger and it took up a lot of this whole neighborhood that we're in. And they couldn't really keep it up anymore. And a cemetery company purchased it because it was a really large amount of open space. Mm -hmm. So it's been an active cemetery since the mid 19th century, but the landscape is still largely intact and this beautiful 18th century mansion is still here too. I saw someone running this morning. I saw someone walking their dog. People really use this space. Yeah, it's one of the most used open green spaces in this neighborhood in West Philadelphia. And a program was started maybe like 10 years ago or more to actually actively garden the plots. This was a rural cemetery in the 19th century. And originally these plots would have all had beautiful little gardens around them. And so recently this has become kind of a community gardening effort here. So there are a lot of flowers. There's bulbs, there's roses, there's perennials. And it's just a quite lovely, beautiful place. Plus, you know, cemeteries, headstones, mausoleums, the obelisks, like those are kind of fascinating too as architectural features around these like gardens and trees. So it's um, unique. There's really nothing like it in Philadelphia. So let's go back to your book. Your book explores some of the most beautiful private gardens and it came out earlier this year. What inspired you to actually document this aspect of Philadelphia life? There is a book that came out in 1929 called Portraits of Philadelphia Gardens, and I got it years ago, and I loved looking through it and seeing what gardens looked like 100 years ago, people's personal gardens, their backyards. Like, I just found it to be so fascinating. And then when the opportunity to do this book 
came up. And I was invited by the photographer that I worked with, Rob Cardillo, to do the writing. I immediately thought of that book and how, not that I'm saying that in 50 years, people are going to still have this book on their bookshelves, but there should be a copy or two lying around and that, you know, people could see this is what gardens looked like in the first quarter of the 21st century. And we live in a really rapidly changing time environmentally, socially, politically, and gardens are a reflection of the time that we live in. And I think it's cool to look at what gardens were like at any given moment in time and what it tells us about life in that time and culture in that time. What is it about Philly's ecological landscape that makes it a good city for these public gardens? I think there's two components. There's the environmental component or ecological component and then the social component. So ecologically, we're just in a pretty sweet spot where, yes, it's hot in the summer, but it's not hot for eight months out of the year. It's cold in the winter, but it's not so cold that we can't grow a lot of really wonderful plants. We have typically like adequate and even rainfall. There's good soil here in Philadelphia and the land really does have these pretty lovely contours and views and little valleys overlooking rivers and even in areas that are built up it's not a super flat city and it's also not one that is so hilly that it's hard to to garden on so that would be what uh, the environmental conditions are that just favor gardens but then socially philadelphia has always been a place that has been very interested in and invested in gardening and horticulture. And something that's interesting to think about with public gardens is that almost all of them at one point were people's private gardens. So the Woodlands where we are right now, this was a private estate. Bartram's Garden that many people have visited, the oldest botanic garden in the country was the home of John Bartram. The Morris Arboretum was the estate of John and Lydia Morris. And really like what exists today are almost shards of what this landscape would have looked like 100 years ago, 200 years ago, when there were a lot of large properties that had elaborate and intensive gardens on them. Climate change, though, has impacted our green spaces. So what could we all be doing right now to do our part with preserving our city's gardens? We should be really looking at what we can do in our own lives to deal with stormwater, because that is one of the things that is the most critical, I would say. I mean, a lot of things we just really don't have control over. And if you think about the kind of storms that we get more and more frequently where we just get dumped on and then it overwhelms Philadelphia's combined sewer. And this is when people get like stuff backing up in their basements and stuff. You see the Schuylkill kind of <laughs> get flooding. It. Yeah, yeah. So anything that we can do as individuals to slow the way that water from storms goes directly into our sewer system. So that would be a rain garden, a rain barrel, or planting a tree or multiple trees. That's something that we can do. And then of course, just like all the things that we can do as individuals to just have a smaller carbon footprint. I mean, everything helps, right? But I would say as individuals, maybe the biggest action that all of us could take would be to plant a tree anywhere, if at all possible. In doing the research for your book, did you learn any commonalities, any differences? Like how are Philadelphians keeping up with their private gardens? 
I don't know if there was much that was specific just to Philadelphia, but I had never spent this much time talking about gardens to people with people. (laughs) Probably a hundred hours of conversations with people about their gardens and what inspires them and what they have overcome or struggle with. And the commonalities that I came away with, which surprised me, were that almost everyone in that's featured in this book, which has beautiful photographs, there's 21 different chapters, each one about a different specific place, garden, and the person's story who gardened it. Almost everybody started from scratch, and almost everyone started not knowing anything about gardening. And over time, figured it out. And that's an important thing with gardening. Like, you can take classes, you can read books, which I encourage anyone to do. But just also do it, and you will learn and figure it out. So that was one thing that I found personally inspiring. And I also found it interesting that of the people that I talked to, so many people... And I don't know whether you ever had this experience as a kid, but had these vivid memories of a parent or a grandparent or a neighbor who pulled a carrot out of the ground and gave it to them when they were a little kid or, you know, taught them how to plant zinnias or radishes. And people spoke about these experiences and memories very movingly. And it just made me think that even though... Spending time with a child in a garden is not an indication that that person is going to be a gardener, that these experiences seem to be meaningful to people. And these memories were ones that they were held very, very fondly. My mom purchased her first home. I was in ninth grade. And one of her biggest things that she wanted to do was have a garden and plant her tomato trees. So... That's what she did. It was tomatoes, green peppers, and uh, green beans. So, yeah. So when you see a tomato growing now, does it make you think of your mom? It does. Yeah. When we come back, Nicole is going to talk more about Philly Gardens and what makes them special after the break. This episode is brought to you by Batiste Dry Shampoo. Whether you're on the go, at the gym, or getting ready for a night out, Batiste has a dry shampoo for you. Refresh with over 10 signature fragrances. Or try Batiste Hint of Color, a tinted dry shampoo that seamlessly blends with your hair. Need an extra boost? Try Batiste Dry Shampoo with added benefits, like volumizing, texturizing, and more. Buy Batiste now, in-store, or online at your nearest retailer. This podcast is supported by Progressive, a leader in RV insurance. RVs are for sharing adventures with family, friends, and even your pets. So if you bring your cats and dogs along for the ride, you'll want Progressive RV Insurance. They protect your cats and dogs like family by offering up to $1,000 in optional coverage for vet bills in case of an RV accident, making it a great companion for the responsible pet owner who loves to travel. See Progressive's other benefits and more when you quote RV Insurance at Progressive.com today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Pet injury is an additional coverage and subject to policy terms. Nicole, before we talk about some gardens that we can visit, what's the difference between public gardens and private gardens? The book that I just published, the book that I just wrote, Private Gardens of Philadelphia, it really focuses on people's home gardens. Sometimes they're tiny, just like a corner lot. Some of these places are very large estates, but they're distinguished from public gardens because they're private property. They're owned and managed by the owner, you know, the the homeowner, Mm -hmm. and they're not open to the public. Whereas public gardens are entities that are not owned by an individual, and their mission is to welcome the public. And oftentimes to educate, to teach people about horticulture, conservation, ecology, biology. So many of them have a strong educational component, but some of them are just ple- for pleasure, just to give people access to green space, which is important. Can you tell us about some of your favorite gardens in the city? 
Yeah, and so we have more gardens, public gardens in Philadelphia than really almost any city. And if then if you expand to within 30 miles of here, we have more public gardens than almost any other, I would say, than any other region of the United States. So we're in a special category unto ourselves. Um, some of the ones that are f the most famous would be Longwood Gardens down at Kennett Square. There are a lot of beautiful gardens in Wilmington, Brandywine Valley. But I wanted to talk about some of the gardens that people might not know about and might not have visited and that are close and would just be an easy place to explore, much like we are right now at the Woodlands. So. Also in West Philadelphia, there is the Bio Pond, which is at 38th and University. And that is a cool little place to almost kind of like wander into. It's only a couple of acres, but it is all shady, which is great in the summertime. It has beautiful plantings. It um, has water. It has picnic benches, picnic tables and benches. It's just a really nice little oasis in the middle of West Philadelphia and University City. So that's one I would recommend some people check out. Great place to bring your lunch. Mm -hmm. I also um, really do like a couple of arboretums in Philadelphia, which I guess technically you would refer to as arborita in the plural. And an arboretum is literally a tree collection. So typically at an arboretum, you would see trees that have been collected intentionally, have been labeled, are accessioned. So an arboretum is really a tree museum in a way, a living museum. And there's Morris Arboretum that probably many people have heard, heard to and before, yeah. had a chance to visit. That's mm -hmm. kind of up at the top of Chestnut Hill, just before you get out of the city. And that's a wonderful place. It has beautiful gardens, a rose garden, a great garden for families to visit, amazing tree collections, an easy place to pack the family up and spend at least half a day uh, wandering around. Mm -hmm. And then there's another arboretum in Germantown that I adore, which is called Aubrey Arboretum. And that's also around 55 acres. It has two sections. It has the formal historic section. And then across Washington Lane is a new section that's like an urban farm and there's a lot of programming and there's the Philly Goat Project there. So I'm and they have a lot of festivals <laughs> yeah. and it's just a, has such a cool vibe there and very welcoming. So the two, the two together are quite different from one another, but um, they're both beautiful and a wonderful place to to spend, again, a couple hours wandering around. And it's free, too. Morris Arboretum, there's uh, an, an entry fee. But I think these other places are all, you know, free and very welcoming. Nicole, I love roses. Anywhere we could see flowers in Philly? In terms of roses, a garden that is very special that people should really make a point of visiting and should visit in the springtime in late May is Wick, which is the oldest rose garden in the country, and it's located in Germantown. And it, it has an incredible rose garden that is intact from the 1820s. And it, it's just astonishing. It is the most beautiful site in the city of Philadelphia in late May, in, in my opinion. I never miss going there. Not all gardens are made up of flowers, though. Are there any gardens that are heavier on the foliage or vegetable side? There is another garden I really love uh, that is also in Germantown, and it's called the Germantown Kitchen Garden. And it's a place that I find very inspiring. It was the site of an apartment building that burned down maybe 30 or 40 years ago. And it just became one of those vacant lots that we all are familiar with in Philadelphia. And a woman named Amanda Staples, she purchased it and transformed it from this overgrown, messy, not attractive piece of abandoned space that was in a neighborhood, residential neighborhood, 
and has turned it into a half acre production garden where she grows and sells vegetables. She grows and sells and also uh, like brings in perennials. So it's actually a really good place to buy plants, which there's not a lot of places to buy garden plants within the city of Philadelphia. And then there's a farmer's market. So if you wanna really see someone growing produce really well in Philadelphia, I would go to Germantown Kitchen Garden on Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. Also really generous about answering questions, about gardening, about how to grow. She's just such an experienced farmer, really. So she understands how to grow almost any kind of edible plant that can be grown well in our climate. Any other lasting points that you want to make about gardens in Philadelphia? We're just really lucky to live here. Uh, We take it for granted that there are interesting, beautiful, historic, significant, meaningful, green, beautiful spaces everywhere, but there aren't. Philadelphia is the seat of the most gardens, the most diverse gardens, the most interesting gardens. So it's easy to do be complacent and to take that for granted when you live here. But I would encourage anyone to look at what we have with a fresh eye and um, spend some time exploring and learning about and appreciating these great spots. That was Nicole Jude, author of Private Gardens of Philadelphia. Thank you so much for getting outside with me today and exploring Philly's garden culture. It was a delight. Thanks for inviting me, Trinae. If you want to get your hands on Nicole's book, you can pick it up at select places like the Philadelphia Museum of Art store, or it's available online. We'll have a link in our show notes. That's all for today here on CityCast Philly. If you enjoyed this episode about the gardens you need to visit in Philly, tell a friend. Rate the show, leave us a review, and hit that subscribe button. Be sure to sign up for our morning newsletter, Hey Philly, to learn more about what else Philly's talking about. We'll be back tomorrow morning with the Friday News Roundup. Bye. Bye.